Mashallah, a lot of you are really, really thirsty. Like you guys were like doing jumping jacks while Imam Yasin was talking or something. Like half of the back of the message like cleared out as soon as he said go get drinks. So, but but still, with that being said, um, one of the things that I that I want to do, you know, I, I understand that there are people that represent different demographics of the community here. So we've got parents here, we've got teenagers, we've got uh, younger kids who are looking like, what are these guys talking about? Right? <laughs> You know, I mean, we, we have different demographics. I'm going to focus on, and, and I can't because I don't believe in accommodating everybody, so I'm sorry. Some of you are going to feel extremely left out of this talk, okay? I'm going to focus on who I think is the most important, which is that, that age, that early, you know, that early age of, teen, the, of the teenage years when you're just starting to discover or someone who's going through a really bad relationship right now or someone who's met the one, right? Now, if I had YouTube, to my, to my benefit, to my disposal. I want you guys to go look up a video whenever you get the chance, all right? You don't have to type this in your phone, it's easy. Stop, stop looking for excuses to use your phone. Everyone got the number? If you're typing a really long question, then stop, just wait till the end. Why guys and girls can't be friends? Anybody seen that before? Why guys and girls can't be friends? Okay, it's not an imam, it's not gonna be a boring shit. Okay? It's not going to be a lecture. It's literally a college student, this guy on some campus, I forgot who it was, non-Muslim, who basically went around asking guys and girls if they could be just friends with the opposite gender. Right? So all the guys that he was asking, you know, were like, yeah, right. You know? The girls were like, yeah, of course. Yeah, I have plenty of guy, friend, guy friends. You know? And then, he kind, of, he kind of flips the script and he goes, well, do you think that that guy friend of yours would be willing to date you if you were to offer yourself to him? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> right? So then, you know, point being made, basically, guys and girls cannot be friends. Imam Yasin said it, you have to understand this, especially girls, okay? Those of you who think this way, see, all the guys know it. You guys know this. Right? You can make this up and you can, you can try to fool yourself or fool someone else. But, but girls, trust me, we're men. We're not going to lie to you. Guys and girls cannot be friends. Unless you guys have been neutered, you are not appropriate. You cannot be friends. Okay? Khalas. Case closed. Everyone understands that? Does anyone have any objection to that? Anybody? Alhamdulillah. Now that we've got that out of the way. How many of you watch Nancy Grace? Sisters, Nancy Grace, guys, Nancy Grace. If you're a guy that watches Nancy Grace, maybe you can be friends with her. <laughs> what are you trying to make? All right. So there is. Do you all remember the Aisha Khan thing? The the girl that disappeared in New Jersey. All right. You guys remember that, right? So Nancy Grace, whenever they were looking for her. Uh, Nancy Grace, basically what she does, she's a reporter on CNN, and, and what they do is they, they try to find uh, subjects that will, you know, invoke a sense of emotion and things of that sort. So even sometimes topics that aren't really that important, right? And that's what the news does, right? It's like, okay, 500 kids died in Somalia today, but Britney Spears shaved her head, right? And that's headline news. So what she does is she always goes out and she, she finds the most newsworthy or the things that will keep people's attention. So Alhamdulillah, they decided to talk about a Muslim, right? Unfortunately, she wasn't really kidnapped. But they decided to talk about a Muslim sister, right? Who was going through that ordeal. And what she did was she brought her, her brother, right, on the phone. She had her brother on the phone. And she's really, really, really annoying, right? I can't stand her. I couldn't stand her before this whole thing happened. But anyway, what, she's, what she was hinting at was that the girl ran away because she was forced into an arranged marriage. Right? That's what she's hinting at. So she's going after her brother, who you can imagine at that moment doesn't feel like dealing with this whole thing, but this is what makes the news, right? This is what makes the news news. Going after her brother and saying, was she in a love, was she in a love marriage or was she in an arranged marriage? Right? And what she was hinting at, she said, was your marriage arranged or was your marriage a love marriage? Right, and essentially he's saying no, you know, he's, he's saying no, you know, I met with my wife a few times before, you know, we got together and then we got married and things of that sort. And then she said, well, here in America, we get married, we have love marriages. 
We get married when we love each other, right? And that's what she was saying. And subhanAllah, the issue here is that our deen, the concepts of our deen, the things that make Islam Islam are consistently under attack. You are consistently being told that your religion is backwards, that your religion is not applicable to you, know, to you as a 21st century American. You are consistently being given that message. I'm consistently being given that message. We watch movies, we, we listen to music that, that gives us that message. Right, the people around us give us that message. Sometimes Muslims act that way, right? Because whenever Muslims, you know, start to behave in a very different way, whenever whenever a non-Muslim is in the room, and we become apologetic over our faith. No, no, we're not terrorists. We don't believe in violence. We don't believe in jihad. There's no such thing as jihad. Who said anything about jihad? There's no such thing as hijab. What are you guys talking about? We're just like you. Let's all just hold hands and sing kumbaya. <laughs> Let's have an interfaith dialogue, which is really just me trying to be accepted. Right? We, we have kind of accepted this inferiority thing. Right? It's an inferiority complex. We think that our deen is inferior. We think that our deen is what makes you know, our country's back home or where our parents came from backwards. Right? We think it's Islam. We take, unfortunately, the cultural, because of our ignorance, the cultural innovations that have, come, that have been passed down to us. We think Islam is backwards because of those cultural innovations. Right? We think the only reason the Muslim world has dictators and has oppressors and the only reason why they haven't gotten so far with this and this and this and that is because of Islam. We have an inferiority complex, but Islam is what took a very indecent bunch called the Arabs of the seventh century, okay, and turned them into an ideal civilization. This is not Islamic history, this is history. Turn them into a people of morality, turn them into a people of progress, turn them into a people of decency, right? Turn them into a people of dignity. Turn them into a people that gave birth to, to math, that gave birth to, to law as we know it today. You know, all, all of these advancements came from the Muslim world. Medical advancement, right? Even the numbers that we use today, right? All of this came from a people that were barbaric, that were so backwards that, that you know, Heraclius, whenever he, he was seeing the dream of the Prophet وسلم, when he, what did he say to, the, to Abu Sufyan? So, you know, I know there, I knew there was a prophet coming, but I didn't think he'd be from you guys. Like, seriously. You are the most backwards people on the face of the earth. And Islam made them human. Islam made them civilized. Islam made them dignified. Right? So that's the first thing. When we say, رَضِينَا بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينَا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ نَبِيًّا وَرَسُولًا We're pleased with Allah as our Lord. We're pleased with Islam as our deen. We're pleased with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as our prophet. We're making the testimony that you know what? We know that this is good for us. Not only are we submitting, not only are we being obedient, we understand that everything that is in the Quran and the Sunnah is better for us. That the Creator knows better than me as a creation because I'm limited by my senses. I can be fooled my, by my senses. And let's face it, we're a pretty stupid creation when it comes down to it. You could be sitting on a roller coaster ride and a cardboard box could jump out at you and you'll scream. Right? It's a cardboard box. You know it's a cardboard box when you get on the ride. You know that that's not really, you know, uh, SpongeBob coming to kill you. But you still scream. Why? Your senses. You're limited by your senses. It's a 4D world for us. You're limited by your senses. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's best for us. So number one, coming to, you know, coming to the conclusion that Allah knows what's better for me and I accept this wholeheartedly and I understand this is what made a very uncivilized people, a backwards people civilized in the first place. And as a human being, this is what's going to give me purpose in life. Because you know, subhanAllah, there are so many books that have been written. Right, I remember one book, The Hell of a Purposeless Life. The Hell of a Purposeless Life. A life with no purpose. And you know, the fuqaha, the scholars of Tuskia, they call it Jahim al ghurur the hell of being deceived, of deluding yourself, right? And this is essentially what's happening. When we're actually believing that our way is inferior. And let me tell you why, subhanAllah aside, you know, I, I appreciate what, he, what Imam Yassim did, he brought statistics, right? He didn't just say Quran and Sunnah says this. No, these are statistics. Sometimes we need to be slapped upside the head with those things. And you know, subhanAllah, when it comes to the idea of a love marriage, right? And essentially, it's infa infatuation, as we said. SubhanAllah, you see all of the pleasant things 
that the other person is putting up as a front. Right? You see their best face and you have no idea what's under that wrapper. Right? It's almost like looking at a piece of chocolate that's wrapped up with a nice wrapper, not knowing what the ingredients are, not knowing where it came from, not knowing anything about it, and saying, I want that one. Just because of the wrapper. Right? And then subhanAllah, the first night, after the first night that you get married, and after all that stuff has happened, you've already experienced, you've already experienced the positive aspects, you've already experienced the joy of love, and the joy of going out together, and the joy of this first time, and that first time, the first time we held hands, the first time we shared a smoothie, the first time we went to the movies together, the first time this, the first time that. And then marriage comes in. All marriages is a bundle of responsibility. And you are going to regret that marriage for the rest of your life. You're going to hate yourself. SubhanAllah. What happened? That front is not there anymore. You're seeing the person for who they are. All the makeup is gone. Right? Makeup's not there anymore. Now you've got white cream everywhere. Right? And Winnie the Pooh, you know, PJs and stuff like that. Like now you've got... What happened? Where did it all go? That's not what I signed up for. It was all the front. It was all the fronts, right? And infatuation is the key. SubhanAllah. What does Islam give us in return? Because you know, SubhanAllah, Allah, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demanded us to be monks, right? To live celibate lifestyles, it would be very tough for us. Everything that Allah gives us, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided in this life that offers joy through a haram avenue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided halal alternative. There is nothing in this life except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a halal alternative and that's purely from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I did a minor in biblical studies. Do you know in old Christian theology, getting married is frowned upon. This is disgusting, right? Celibacy is the only way. If a person gets married, that person is someone who's doing something detested, repulsive. How dare they, right? SubhanAllah. I mean, in, in other theologies, obviously the only way to really achieve <coughs> spiritual illumination is to go to the extreme of being celibate, living, living that life, right, as a monk. In our deen, we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through marriage, which gives us joy anyway. SubhanAllah, marriage is half of your deen. That's a rahmah. That's a rahmah. That half of your deen is something that's as tangible as marriage, as making that work, as seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through another human being, as through showing mercy to another human being, right? Through restricting your ego with another human being. And here's what happens whenever we get into the whole love marriages and the infatuation. I did a little bit of research myself. You know the whole first love thing? You know, I'm not even going to talk about something as extreme as, as losing your virginity. Talking about the concept of your first love. There is a Pittsburgh sociological journal, and what the statistic that they have, do you know how many people actually end up marrying their first love? You know how many people actually end up marrying their first love? Anyone want to give me a percentage? 0.85%. That means if you meet 100 people, 99 of them ended up marrying someone, or if they even got married, right? 100 married people, 99 of them married someone that they did not think they were going to be with. 99 of them, 99 of them fell for it. And you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us something that's hard? Ask the people that have been through relationships. That's a hell, that's jahim al -wurur. To invest emotionally, to invest yourself emotionally into something that's not even going to give you anything at the end of the day. To tell someone your secrets, to, to trust somebody, you know, and the extent of the trust, Allah Ta'ala, I don't know how far it goes sometimes, right? You trust them with your secrets, you trust them, you say, I want to be with you for the rest of my life. You trust them with parts of your body, right? I've had many times, subhanAllah, in, in my six years as, as being Imam, I retired, alhamdulillah, I mean, I hung my throat up in the masjid. This is your, this is your, <laughs> this is all you now. <laughs> now, subhanAllah, so I had so many situations, religious MSA kids, kids that were like all into it, right? And the sister who wears hijab and jilbab says, well, we Skype, and I decided I can take off my hijab in front of him on Skype. I just take off my hijab, because I know I'm going to marry him. I know I'm going to marry him. It never happens. Never happens. Why? Because there's no barakah in it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It always falls apart. 
it always falls apart. That's a hell, that's punishment in this world. To go through relationship after relationship after relationship, and every time you get in a relationship, you know what? A piece of you dies. Capacity to love dies. Capacity to trust, a piece of that goes away. Right? Your emotion, all of it, it, go, it gets lower and lower and lower and lower. Your expectations, they only rise. Because you're seeing more and more and more flaws, right? SubhanAllah, you know, when you talk, when you talk about how detrimental pornography is, has been on society, why has pornography been so detrimental to society? Why, have all, why has all of this whole, you know, this image that's being shoved down our throats, why is it so detrimental? Because it's not real. It's not reality. And the fact of the matter is, is whenever you find out that reality is a lot harsher than what it's been made out to be, then it's hell, it's punishment, it's jaheem al ghurur Consistently going relationship after relationship after relationship, trying to make it work, trying to find a way to make this halal, trying to find a way to get my parents to agree with this. And then that doesn't happen, subhanAllah. And let me tell you why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops. And you know, you want to talk about practicality. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, get married for four, four, you know, you can get married for four reasons. You get married for a person's wealth, for their status, for their beauty, or for their deen. فَضْفِرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينْ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكَ Choose deen, or else, you know, may your hands be covered in dust. Meaning, it's permissible. Look, you can get married to a person because you like the way they look. It's halal. But it's not smart. It's not smart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that option. It's from the mu'amala. From a fiqhi perspective, as long as you fulfill the requirements of marriage from both sides, if you decided to pursue a person for their beauty, it's halal. It's just not wise. It's not smart. Because that's not something that's going to last. The looks will go. And then you'll have to deal with the other stuff. And the other stuff might not be so pleasant. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting us from is having our rationale slanted, our thinking slanted. No one of you can tell me that dating does not make them biased and does not, does not make them make you know, an uninformed decision. Marriage is a lifetime commitment. This is the person that's going to be the, the, the other parent of your children. This is the person that's going to come. This is the person you're going to confide in. This is the person when you go through financial difficulty, the economy is only getting worse. And trust me, you will go through financial difficulty at least once in your life. You will, right? This is the person that you're going to have to lean on for support. This is the person you're going to have to lean on whenever you get betrayed on the outside. And if, you, if, if you're not making a rational, an informed decision, whenever you get married, then you're just like that person who's basically willing to eat a piece of chocolate just because they like the way the rapper looks. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to make the best decision. Why? And, and let me tell you what. A lot of times we go into a relationship with the whole halal cover. Because shaitan deceives us. Shaitan makes things seem halal. Right? At least we're not doing this. At least we're not doing that. But we're going to get married. But we only talk about deen, you know, here and there. You know, subhanAllah, shaitan deceives us and he deludes us. But let me tell you what happens, right? Here's what I've dealt with a million times. And I'm sure Imam Yasin will say the same thing. Whenever you say, but I like her for her religion too. She's a religious person. Or he's a good brother, right? It's not just that. But why do you think he's religious, right? Why do you think she's religious? What caused you to have a biased view at this point? Let me tell you something. If you already want to marry someone for other reasons, you will make that person out to be religious even if they're, even if they're not religious. You know, MashaAllah, she's so good. Why is she so good? She listens to Surah Rahman every night. MashaAllah. You know, you ignore all the other stuff. MashaAllah. He's such a good brother. He's so religious. Why is he so religious? MashaAllah, he prays five times a day. Sahabi. <laughs> You'll make him out to be whatever you want him to be because you already want him. Your decision making has been slanted and you're about to make the most important decision of your life and it's biased and it's crooked. Why? Because you allowed your infatuation to cloud your rationale, your judgments. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to do that. Essentially, you know, some people say, well, does that mean, you know, we go all for arranged marriages, right? You know, it's funny, whenever the older generation, no offense, I told you I'm targeting one, one, uh, one, one demographic, right? Whenever brothers and sisters brag, you know, Beta, I never saw your mother before we got married. <laughs> Not once. 
I didn't know how she looked. Mm, that's not going to work right now. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Okay? And it's not the Sunnah. It's not from the Sunnah. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu he gave permission. You go and you look. Right? Not, not without hijab. I don't know where we've got this idea now that women can take off their hijab when they're being considered for marriage. Right? SubhanAllah. Not without hijab. You look at the person. Right? You look at their face. You, you know, you get to know one another, fine, in a halal way. I'll talk about what that means exactly, unless I get that five minute card or, or time up. But you, those things are factors in the marriage. They're factors in the marriage. But what do you look for first? What is the basis for your pursuit of a person? Deen, right? So essentially, when you want to eat a piece of chocolate, does anyone have a piece of chocolate here? I need a demonstration or a piece of gum. I'll keep saving the butterfinger for you. Kit Kat. If I don't know what a Kit Kat is, if I just got off of a boat from somewhere else in the world and they didn't have Kit Kats there, that's a really backwards country if they didn't have Kit Kats. Whatever. What's the first thing I want to know about this? The ingredients. What is it? What is it made of? Right? Is it chocolate? Is it hard candy? My teeth can't handle hard candy. I'm not a big fan of caramel. I'm, you know, is it white chocolate? What is it? Milky Way? What is it? Milk? What is it? The first thing you want to know are the ingredients. The ingredients are something that you look for. And you know what? That's going to lead you to the next step. Where did it come from? Where was it manufactured? Look, let me tell you guys a secret about chocolate. If it comes from Switzerland, it's awesome. <laughs> I think it's what? An English. An English? Oh. <laughs> I wasn't very impressed with the food thing. I was just in the UK last week. They were giving me a hard time over my American accent. Like, it's like, subhanAllah, I don't know how you adapted here, man, when it comes to like... Because everything I would say there turned out to be funny. When I got to the airport, when I got to the airport and I was calling the brothers and I said that I'm wearing khaki pants and a brown sweater. They just bust out laughing. I'm like, why are you guys laughing? And apparently pants over there means underwear. <laughs> they say trousers. So if you ever hear Nami Yassin say trousers, that's why. Everything was funny over there. First, you want to know the ingredients. You pursue on the basis of what it's made of. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Pursue on the basis of deen. Not that every single person who has deen is going to be compatible with you. But the basis of your looking at a person in the first place is deen. What it's made of. Then you want to know where it came from. If someone, Allah, Rasulullah actually gave us two criteria, by the way. For looking for a person, considering a person. Deen and character. Deen and character. The inner beauty of a person. The way that person acts. The way that person treats people. Right? All of that is considered in khuluf. Because you know what? There are people that have religion. They wear religion on their sleeves. But their character is terrible. They have no character whatsoever. They're rude. They don't smile at people. They're not, the, you know, they're gonna, they, they're shady with their business practices. They're, and the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked about the woman who uh, was, 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 was rough with her neighbors, who was abusive towards her neighbors, was verbally abusive towards her neighbors, but she prayed, right? She, she was doing salah, she was doing zakah, she was doing all the outward act rituals. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about her? What did he say? Somebody tell me. Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ, there's a woman who prays, she, she did all that stuff, but she was abusive towards her neighbors. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about her? Imam Yasin can't answer. He's not gonna bail you out. What did he say? Come on. Yes. He a finna, right? We all know that she's in hellfire part. Usually, even the adults will say she's in hellfire. But the Prophet said something else. The Prophet said, La khayra fiha he a finna. She has no good inside of her. She is devoid on, uh, of spirituality on the inside. She's in the hellfire. Meaning what? Khuluq, the inner beauty of a person, translates to how they deal with the people. Right? So you look towards their deen, you look towards their character. Then is it important to consider beauty? Is it important to consider physical attraction? Yes, it is. It's not haram. 
The Prophet ﷺ would not have given permission to look. These were Sahaba. These were the greatest men. You know, these were this was the greatest generation. Why? Because if, if I'm not physically, I'm not saying that she, you know that person has to be, you know, uh, what I've been looking at, you know, in terms of billboards and in terms of what I've been seeing on Yahoo.com whenever I log, whatever. That I'm not saying she has to look like that, right? And by the way, let me tell you something. People who are picky with looks end up marrying, some, marrying someone that, that, that totally is below their standards. Like 10 years later, once they start balding and getting fat, then all of a sudden the standards have gone down, right? Standards are not there anymore. So I'm not talking about being too picky, but, but I'm talking about minimal physical attraction, something that will help me to lower my gaze. That's practicality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that, right? I need someone that's going to help me lower my gaze. I need to look towards someone that will help me lower my gaze. That's fine. That's acceptable. Right? The other factors come in. Right? And yes, is family considered? Yes. Let me tell you why the main reason why marriage is... And by the way, you know the statistic, I'll be the first to admit, the statistic that's, that shows how much more successful arranged marriages are than love marriages, this is what they would call it. Right? Obviously they're different degrees of arranged marriages, but the statistics show that arranged marriages are much, much, much more uh, successful. But I'll even say that statistic is biased because of culture. No doubt about it, right? In some cultures, you know, uh, getting a divorce is blasphemous, right? So yes, that statistic is biased. But, but at the same time, one of the major points that's made there about why it's better to marry with your family on your side, right? where there's agreement between the families, where there's, where there's a sense of sakina, where the environment is tranquil and peaceful, is because whenever you have problems in your marriage, you will have problems in your marriage, who are you gonna go to for support? You're gonna go towards your family. You're gonna go towards your, you know, you're going to go towards your family, you're gonna count on them. Even if you think that you're not going to count on them, at the end of the day, you will go back to them counting on them, if two people get into a marriage where the parents don't like each other, or the parents don't like the other person, we, we already made this happen and then we're saying, Dad, Mom, you have to, you know, you got to deal with this. It's going to happen regardless. What happens is when, that, when those problems start to take place, they have no one to look to for support. Right? The, the, out, the, out, the external environment is actually pushing them to separate. Right? And that's going to come most of the time when people get married only because of infatuation, because they've spent time with each other, so on and so forth. That's usually what's going to come is an unsupportive environment. That's not Qur'an and Hadith. That's statistics. That's how it is. Right? And if everything around you is pushing you to separate, you know what the divorce rate in this country is? 55%. When you get married, you are more likely to get a divorce in this country than to stay married. That's terrible. SubhanAllah. When you get married, I have a great... Imagine when people are walking the aisle in this country. You know, it's not even a 50-50 chance anymore. Most likely the person that I'm walking the aisle with right now is not going to be my wife in a few years. That's terrible. Why? Because you know what? It's not all that it's being made out to be. We have to trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has our best interests in mind. So with that being said, I want to just, uh, I know that I'm going to get the notes. So I just want to, because I know that people always say this isn't practical enough. Right? It's not practical. We understand the concept. We have to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to submit. So I want to, I want to try to give some, some tips. Usually the major obstacle to marriage, because usually what's going to happen when people say, well, I want to get married, but who's stopping me? Parents. Right? And to all of the parents here, I will address you directly now. Do not expect your kids to stay away from haram when you're making halal so hard. And haram is so easy to them. Do not expect them to stay away from haram. You know, subhanAllah, the scholars have emphasized, both past and present, the importance of helping people to get married. SubhanAllah. I remember Imam Uthameen rahimahullah ta'ala even was talking about, you know, the priority in zakah. The priority in zakah. Give charity to a poor person who's having trouble getting married. Help, your, help, help these people get married. So that's a priority in this day and age because of the, you know, the, the, the incredible amount of fitna around us. Right? Haram is so easy. Don't make halal hard. It's, 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 it's just, we're just not living in a society anymore 
Or even if you go to these websites, right? It's like, subhanAllah, you look at the demands, right? 30 year old dermatologist, you know, seeking, you know, 32 year old dermatologist from Hyderabad or from Gujarat or from whatever it is, or from, from Ramallah or whatever it is, whose grandfather rode a donkey with my grandfather or something like that. It's like, Seriously? And then you say you're not racist, and then subhanAllah, whenever the time comes, whenever someone comes who has deen, who has khuluk, who's compatible, right? Well, they're not from our family. They're not from our race. They're not from our tribe. They're from a different country. Oh, don't you know? All of these people are like this. All of those people are like that. That's satanic. SubhanAllah. And you wonder why your children are not motivated towards doing things the halal way. So parents, Make sure that you're supportive. Even if you are not, I'm not even gonna pay attention to them. <coughs> even if you are, even if you're not in agreement with that person, right? Even if your kid comes up to you at 18 years old and says, Mom, Dad, I wanna get married. Even if it's not realistic at that point, at least show some support. At least say, okay, we're gonna help you inshallah. You know, just get through this much. And I don't mean get through med school and residency and then get, get a job for two years. Right? It's unrealistic. I'm sorry. Get through this much, then inshallah, we'll help you. We will help you. We'll support you. SubhanAllah. You know, at least show them support. Show them that I'm in your corner, that I want to help you. I understand this is an obligation. I'm going to be on your side because it makes the youth very, very, very hopeless when they get just a flat no from their parents. So we have to support our youth, inshallah ta'ala, in getting married. And yes, Getting married young is from the Sunnah. Getting married young is from the Sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The person who gets married to protect themselves has a right upon Allah subhanahu wa taala to be supported. Allah subhanahu wa taala is not a half a million dollar making you know doctor somewhere. Allah subhanahu wa taala is the creator of the universe, and the person who tries to protect themselves." For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and goes out, you know, to seeking marriage the halal way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed them that He will help them. So we have to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also as parents. We also have to have our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now on the, on the flip side of that, you know, I remember, um, uh, you know, I remember Shaykh Abdul Bari uh, Yahya just recently, he posted something on his Facebook that was really, really interesting. But he said basically, if, if, you know, if your mom is still uh, folding your bed sheets and still doing everything for you, then don't expect to just get a wife who's basically going to replace your mom. You have to also show that you're responsible enough, inshallah, that you're making steps towards that, that you're motivated, that you're on your way to, to, to trying to become financially independent, so on and so forth. Okay? Make that way. Fine. Now, let's say that the parents are not agreeing to the person that you want. Alright? There are plenty of fish in the sea. Seriously. There are plenty, plenty of hijabis in the masjid. There are plenty of thobes in the masjid. <laughs> plenty of fish in the sea. Now, if it's a situation where this is a person that is truly, you know, subhanAllah, who's really at a different level, Seek the counsel of, of the Mashayikh, you know, seek the counsel of the Imams. Try to get people involved. Make his life a little bit harder. Give him more work. Seriously, let me tell you why. You know, in many communities, when I say that I feel guilty because the first thing that's going to come back to me is that people are going to say, we don't have Imams in this community. Dallas is blessed. Dallas is blessed. MashaAllah. There's Imams everywhere. Use those Imams. Use those counselors. Get other people involved. Fine. And at the same time, you pray istikhara. You know, this is the biggest decision in your life. You pray istikhara. And when you pray istikhara, please don't expect a dream to come. And if you see a dream, you've been thinking about that person anyway. It's not the answer to your istikhara. All right? If, if, you, if you prayed istikhara and then mashallah, you saw him in his, you saw your knight in shining armor, it's just because you were thinking about him. It's not istikhara. Istikhara, you're essentially asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if this is good for me, make it easier for me. If it's bad for me, put obstacles between me and it. Simple as that, right? Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that. Sometimes people come to me and they say, I want to pray istikhara. You know, how do I pray istikhara? Then when I tell them what istikhara is, they're like, can I just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me that person? <laughs> so basically you're saying, whether it's a good move or not, I still want that one. Even if it's good or bad. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
pray istikhara and do not listen to me very carefully sometimes you will be justified in doing this in the sense sometimes you will find someone who is compatible but your families are not agreeing you don't understand how important families getting along is to our marriages you have no idea subhanallah it is that important it's that crucial right and do not sacrifice a relationship that started with your with your existence on this earth for a person that you've known for two three months seriously don't sacrifice a relationship for 20 25 30 years for a person that you've known for two three four months you cannot be willing to throw that out of the door you can't right if your parents are unjustified and really you know you're, you there are not many options get someone else involved Try to reason with them, try to bring them inshallah ta'ala to, you know, try to bring them to, to agree to that. But then, you know, just make sure you are not going to be one of those people who comes and says, well, in this school of thought, I don't need a wedding. Come on. Don't play that game. Don't play that game. Or, you know, technically speaking, I don't need my dad to agree. I don't need my mom to agree. Right, don't do that. Don't throw away those relationships. If you start, and this is why, again, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wisdom of this deen. If you start and you make a rational decision, and when you are when you are looking at potential candidates for marriage, you don't have anything that's that's making you biased, that's slanting you towards one direction or the other, and you ask the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you and you include your family, involve your family from the very, very, very start, inshallah ta'ala, you will find that person. Be patient. You will find that person. Do not put yourself through the torture of relationship after relationship after relationship thinking that that's a better alternative. That's just going to make you more depressed. That'll ruin you even more. And I can tell you, subhanAllah, many Imams, many people that, that, that you might look up to and respect, they've been through that too. Everybody goes through a phase, right? But just make sure that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you, again, when you are going to make the most important decision of your life, Make sure you make it considering all of the factors. And if your family, parents, please listen to me. Cooperate with your children. Help them, right? Don't be hypocritical with your standards. Help them find that right person. Be supportive of them. Listen to them. If they have someone that they're considering, listen to them. Right? Consider subhanAllah the best option in that regard. Right? And, and make sure that you don't allow them to become hopeless. Because if they become hopeless, Essentially, Shaytan became hopeless. Ablasa. Time up. All right, fine. Shaytan became hopeless. Ablasa. Wa shaytana. He became hopeless. He distanced himself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Shaytan does what he does. Don't allow your kids to become hopeless. Help them. And youth, don't become hopeless because even if your parents are terrible and even if your parents are not helping you out, if you go out and you form a haram relationship, you're still going to bear that burden on the day of judgment. Okay? You're still going to bear that burden. So inshallah, because my time is up, I'm going to stop blabbing now and I think we'll take questions inshallah.